Seminar number 185, and we are approaching the magic 200 mark. Trevor is cooking up something special for us on the day of that webinar. But today we have Lily Yang and Lin Tian, and they're going to talk to us about rethinking global common goods in higher education through the Chinese concept of Tiangxia Weigong. This is a new and fruitful way to think about the global role of universities and colleges, including their research and science throughout the world. Uh, it opens up a Chinese way of seeing things, which will be very interesting and perhaps somewhat challenging for our non-Chinese participants, which is the majority of those who have registered for today's seminar. So lots of learning to do, I think, the underlying message here is that the Chinese tradition is deep and very successful in the modern period, and there's a lot to learn from it. And equally, there's a process of exchange going on in China where Chinese society, colleagues in higher education and students are learning from other countries. So it's a process of exchange and a process of blending, I think, of the best ideas from different traditions. But that's where Lily and Lynn will take us. Now, Lily is a postdoctoral research associate at CG. She works with me, in fact, on the public good role of higher education. And she recently passed her doctoral thesis examination uh, with requirement for no corrections, always the best result to get. So congratulations, Lily. That's a big milestone. Um, years of work and a very good thesis finished. Um, and Lin Tian is in more or less the same position. She finished her doctoral thesis at Shanghai Jiatong University Graduate School of Education recently as well. And she's now an assistant professor at Hunan University, a 985 university, double world class, I assume, to Lin, in China. Uh, and um, her doctoral degree was in management at Shanghai Jiatong. And she also has been working on the CG project on the public good role of higher education and assisted with both the uh, data collection and the writing from that project. So with no further delay, apart from the, the protocols for the webinar, I'll be able to pass over to our presenters. The protocols, of course, you will know. Um, webinar is being recorded, be posted online within 48 hours uh, on the CG website, and you'll be able to see it in YouTube. Transcript of the chat function is also posted. So be warned, everything you say now will be uh, on record for all time. Um, please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or asked a question and you can leave your video off as well. But when you come into the conversation, when you raise your point, ask your question, good idea to turn on your uh, camera at that point. Um, now to ask a question, use the chat function, uh, type your question out in writing in the chat and we'll compose the Q&A list from on the basis of what's appearing in the chat. We recommend that you use the speakers view Zoom, Zoom setting so you can see who is speaking at any given time. When we get to the Q&A section, I'll call you in. I'll send you a message beforehand just to give you a warning, um, but I'll, I'll call you in um, by name and uh, at that point you uh, unmute yourself, switch on your video and then state your name and where you're from and make your point or ask your question. Okay, at this point, let me, um, hand over to Lily and to Lynn. Thank you, Simon. I will start. Um, I would first wait to share my screen. We need you to turn your sound up a bit, Lily, I think. Okay, can you hear me now? That's better. Could be louder. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the slides? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Simon, for your very kind introduction. It's indeed my privilege to talk about this important topic, I think, from a Chinese perspective and in front of our participants from all over the world. Well, in today's webinar, I'm going to think about the long-standing under-provision of collective goods, especially global collective goods in higher education, and suggest that we might benefit from the Chinese idea of Gong, which literally means all under heaven, belongs to all, and is for all. After my presentation, Dr. Lin will, Dr. Lin Tian will join us and share with us some of her thoughts and comments, which I am very looking forward to. 
Um, before I actually start with my presentation, I'd like to very briefly say something about the background of this work. It's part of my doctoral study that explores, compares, and combines ideas concerning the public of higher education in the Sinic and liberal Anglo-American traditions. Among the five themes for comparison that I identified in the exploration, the global collective goals in higher education is arguably the most under-discussed one, but it's showing its re growing relevance and importance. And this is arguably the right time to touch upon this important topic if we think about the ways different countries have employed to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. And this figure from the Johns Hopkins website is showing a big difference of cumulative cases between East Asia and the West, especially the US. Many have pointed out cultural differences accounting for the varied attitudes and ways in mitigating the spread of the coronavirus. One of the key differences is the relationship between the individual and the social. In a, in a YouTube video, Martin Jakes, who is also the author of the One China Rules, um, sensibly points out that in China, there is a degree of harmony, of intimacy, of coordination between the people and the government, between government and society, which doesn't exist in anything like the same way in the West. And the, there is this familial relationship between the individual, society, and the government. His point is that China, in China, Chinese people are not seeing the state or the, or the government as an extended body or as an enemy, as many Americans do. And people are not regarded as separate from each other or separate from society, from the government, as they are in the West. And Martin Jakes here is actually pointing out a very important cultural aspect in China, which is the world, the worldview, the Confucian way of understanding the world, which is also referred to the anthropocosmic worldview by many people. This anthropocosmic worldview is not only relevant to the way people are connected within a country, for example, the relationship between people and society or the relationship between people and the government, it goes beyond the national borders and touches the world as a whole. That is the relationship between individual and humanity, between country and the world, and between humanity and nature. As the left figure shows, the smaller entities are nested within the larger entities, from the individual to Tianxia or on the heaven. And Tianxia is the largest entity in this imaginary. The left, the right figure here is just to show how these two kinds of social imaginaries differ from each other. As I've talked about these two in my previous CG webinar, I don't want to repeat myself here. What I want to focus on today is the idea of Tianxia. Today um, in academia, there are primarily two ways to interpret Tianxia. One is Tianxia as a normative appeal, that is to focus on the abstract and discursive Confucian idea of Tianxia. And the other one is Tianxia in real politic, foc that focuses on designing a world governance system in real politic based on the Tianxia normative idea. Let's talk about it one by one. First, Tianxia as a normative appeal. It implies transcendence of the nation state perspective. It normatively constructs a universal order of Tianxia unbounded by ethnicity or geography. In the Sinic tradition, Tianxia is a symbolic ideal reflecting a universal civilizational order. For Confucianism, the ultimate aim is to bring harmony and peace to all under heaven. There is no boundary to the reach of Tianxia. Tianxia, Wei Gong, all under heaven belongs to all and is for all, demonstrates an idea of no other. This is very different to the dualistic worldview of I and non-I, which was also talked about by Professor Christ Christopher Newfield in his uh, web CG web webinar last Thursday. In the framework of Tianxia and Tianxia Wei Gong, due to there being no other, the relationship between different entities, including either individualistic or collective entities, is not zero-sum, but potentially reciprocal and harmonious. Well, Wang defines Tianxia as a system of governance held together by a regime of culture and value that, transcend, that transcends racial and ge geographical boundaries. There is this emphasis on culture, 
value and mutual acceptance and recognition rather than racial or geographical boundaries. In other words, a Tianxia system is not an international system consisting of independent nation states. Instead, it appeals for transcendence of the international world so as to understand the world as a world per se. What I want to highlight here is the normative core of Tianxia values. Values of Tianxia that are particularly emphasized include the pursuit of order and harmony, embracing diversity as aspects of a harmonious and peaceful Tianxia, as reflected in the phrase of harmony without conformity, he er bu tong in Chinese. This requires flexibility, mutual understanding, respect, and dialogue. Mere tolerance, in, as in the Western sense, is not enough. Confucianism endorses a series of moral values represented by the five constant virtues, including benevolence, graciousness, propriety, wisdom, and integrity. As a foundational pillar to uphold the social order, the pillar of virtue to a large extent constituted formal and legal regulations in guiding people's daily life in Imperial China. And the notion of Tianxia takes five constant virtues to the level of the world as a whole. According to Zhao Tingyang, a very important um, political philosopher in China who also works on Tianxia, the Tianxia idea requires us to think through the world, not to think of the world. Thinking through the world highlights at least three aspects. First, it understands the world as a collective agent shared by human beings as well as all other creatures on earth. The world in this, in this case is not an aggregation of independent nation states as methodological nationalism imagines. It's a single entity with sub collective agents. Secondly, the priority for the different levels of entities or spheres is the good of Tianxia rather than parochial interests. For example, at the individual level, every human being becomes responsible to serve the good of Tianxia. This is consistent with a Sinic collectivist tradition that prioritizes the collective good over the individualistic good. Thirdly, to think through the world paves the way for discussing world global citizenship. In the perspective of Tianxia, the national identity of the individual is secondary to being a member of Tianxia. The starting point is Tianxia, not the nation state. And arguably this points out to the identification between the cl global collective good and the good of Tianxia. Well, there is another strand of this discussion, which is Tianxia in real politics, which is, may invite more disputes and challenge. Um, for example, Zhao, Zhao Tingyang himself, he moves, uh, he moves forward from the, real, from the normative idea and say that, and imagine how the idea of Tianxia may be in, implemented in real politics. He argues for a political entity that's at, at the Tianxia level. In Zhao's imagination, the world is an organic whole and there are lower level entities below the world, but these are not nation states. An example of Tianxia system in history is the Zhou Dynasty, which can be dated back to 1000 BCE in China. While existing international organizations like the United Nations are not the kind of institutional representatives in Tian, of Tianxia, um, perhaps the closest existing institution is the European Union, although it's operating at a regional, not global level. In the Tianxia framework, the institutions at the global level produce collective goods of Tianxia for all humanity and nature. In Zhao's imagination, meritocracy, not democracy, is used for selecting political leaders for global institutions. Tianxia incorporates the people's will, which is mingxin in Chinese. Democracy is only one technical method for revealing the will of people. Democracy is not an end in itself. The end is the people's will, how to reflect people's will. In Zhao's opinion, the best way to capture the will of the people is meritocracy, elites lease in Tianxia. And Duara provides a nice a summary of this idea that it imagines the cultural empire would use ritual as a means to limit the self and its interests. It prioritizes order over freedom, elite govern governance over democracy, and the superior political institution over the lower level. 
No wonder this kind of idea will invite challenges and critics. And there are a lot of discussions of, of how this idea may not work and what problems it has. A central concern is the inter-nation interstate relations and the equality between states, which is a foundational pillar of the existing interstate relationship, although this is not always well implemented in reality. In the Tianxia system, at least in scholarly discussion, although this is never um, mentioned in a single word in official statements, it's acceptable to have hierarchy between states. Some critics argue that in imperial times, such as under the Zhou dynasty, Tianxia was structured with China as the inner part and neighboring countries as the outer part, as manifested in the Sino-centric tributary system. Callahan argues that this inner and outer relationship is a structural parallel of central periphery relations today. Some Tianxia scholars and researchers justify such a hierarchy by attaching to it a graded system of responsibilities. For example, um, po a political scientist uh, philosopher Yan Xuetong from Tsinghua University state argues that countries with higher positions can take larger responsibilities for, meet, for maintaining the order of Tianxia, including help for those in need. And this is of course, again, criticized and criti critics of the Tianxia system point to the potential for major countries to influence or dominate weaker, com weaker countries. Callahan questions China's use of Tianxia. He sees Tianxia not as a regime of culture and authority, but the projection of a global hegemon. Many Chinese scholars, researchers say that with the rise of its economic power, China needs to expand its uh, soft power and that one way of facilitating this is through reimagining the world order. And Tianxia provides a possible way for China to establish its own discourses. For example, the efforts around the Belt and Road Initiative and the very recent idea proposed by President Xi Jinping, the shared future for humanity. These interpretations are not inconsistent with Callahan's critiques. Well, many Tianxia scholars who endorse Tianxia idea are aware of these critics and argue that while a Tianxia system might be hierarchical, there would not be coercion by the country with greatest power or greater powers. They point out that in Chinese history, the imperial state seldom interfered with or invaded tributary countries. Harmony and respect is the core values that are treasured by the powers and this is something that might need to be considered in the contemporary time. Mutual trust and respect is the key. It's a core requisite if the Tianxia idea is to be taken forward in real politics. However, mutual trust between agents, institutions, countries with diverse races, cultures, values, and languages is not easy to achieve. Um, realizing these difficulties Fei Xiaotong, a Chinese sociologist, set, emphasizes self-cultural awareness, summarized as an appreciation of one's own culture, an understanding and appreciation of other cultures, and mutual respect would result in peoples living together harmoniously, which then leads to the status of unity, of harmony without conformity. And it's important to highlight here that such mutual trust, although it's hard to not easy to be realized in many fields, it's easier, rather easier, to be established in higher education. Although researchers, scholars may argue a Tianxia system would work on the basis of voluntary participation rather than coercion, however, the Tianxia idea may remain vulnerable to coercive mechanisms of, dom of dominance. Perceptions of this danger may prevent it from being employed in the contemporary world. In addition, some other researchers, scholars also argue that Tianxia merely pictures a utopia that has never existed in history and can hardly be achieved today. So in some, there were at least three obstacles for Tianxia idea to be employed in the contemporary world. The three obstacles shows how Tianxia in real politics is in contrast with the core ideas of the current world order. The first is its emphasis on stability versus 
the idea of liberty in today. The second is using meritocracy to, to gov as a me mechanism of governance versus democracy in the, as a dominant idea today. And third, using norms, values, and rituals to uphold the order versus using law and contract in that way. Nevertheless, despite the difficulty in employing the Tianxia idea in real politics, the problems of the current world order, including unresolvable power struggles and the under provision of global collective goods, point to the value of considering the idea of Tianxia as a normative appeal. Given the urgency of the problem, and Will Hitchback and scholars from East Asia have worked on ways to integrate cosmopolitan visions and the Tianxia worldview. Beck himself proposes a cosmopolitan sociology that addresses the fundamental fragility and the mutality of social dynamics shaped by the globalization of capital and risks today. Beck's, Beck's uh, cosmopolitan sociology requires five aspects. First, criticizing methodological nationalism. Second, introducing the concept of co uh, cosmopolitan co cosmopolitanization. Third, remapping social inequalities. Fourth, discussing risk, risk society in the context of East Asian development. And fifth, proposing a cosmopolitan vision. And Beck and Han, Xin, and Park argue that cosmopolitanism can be consolidated and rendered more effective when the normative layer of the Tianxia worldview is added. Then what we can learn from this Tianxia idea in higher education? Well, I want to um, list five implications here to provoke further discussions in this area. The, the five implications are related to the prioritization of national goods in higher education, which are associated with the under provision of global collective goods the central intention here is to rethink the relationship between the state and the world in higher education and what higher education universities can do to respond to the long standing tension between the two. And is it necessary to see the two as in a long standing conflict? First, the first limitation I'd like to highlight is uh, in relation to academic freedom. While academic freedom is nationally nuanced, it also has a common global aspect. No academic faculty anywhere want to be told by non-faculty what they can and cannot learn, investigate, or teach. All faculty share a commitment to the pursuit of truth, yet in many countries for reasons such as public accountability requirements, national security considerations, and other governmental regulations, official policies interfere with free academic decision-making. If we think from a Tianxia perspective, Higher education should need to work towards a global common commitment to specif specif specified and active and, and positive academic freedoms. And this is, this will, this negative and positive academic freedoms is another um, topic and will invite a lot of other discussions that I will not expand here. Secondly, there is also, there is also often but not always an emphasis on addressing national issues when providing research funding for higher education. Sometimes funding provided by governments is targeted to specified research topics or more generally designated areas of national priority. When governments invest in topics that are mostly relevant to domestic issues, research for producing global collective goods can be under supported. If we think from a perspective of Tianxia that there is a prioritization of global collective goals. Then to better respond to global challenges and issues, it's, it's essential to provide national government and non-government financial support for research on global topics. The anthropocosmic worldview of which stresses the harmonious balance between humanity and late nature also provides a framework for global ecological research grounded in Tianxia. Third, the privatization of knowledge, which to a certain extent is reinforced by the intellectual property rights regime, arguably hampers the global dissemination and reproduction of knowledge produced by higher education. In addition, there is also global inequalities in the global knowledge system. 
This is against the idea that knowledge is a global common or collective good shared by all humanity. Knowledge is a global collective good belonging to all, all under heaven from the perspective of Tianxia. And even though we, we will have this, even though we are not speaking from this perspective, we still have this statement. There is a need to better balance the relationship between knowledge available for humanity and protecting intellectual property rights. Fourth, national governments may focus strongly on higher education's role in preparing students as national citizens. Moral and citizenship education often contains a nationalist strand with global elements less visible. The nationalist element, such as certain ideas of patriotism, does not always contribute to the cultivation of global citizens. Well, if we think from a Tianxia perspective, while higher education is often effective in preparing national citizens, states need to further emphasize the importance of preparing global citizens and the individual's responsibility and identification as a, with a global citizen should come first. And fifth, international mobility is a global collective good, but countries' immigration and visa regulations often contain barriers restricting mobility. Mostly, the more influential is the nationalist strand in politics, the stricter will be the visa regulations. Arguably, the limitation posed on students and academics by such regulations impedes higher education's production of global collective goods. For example, in 2020, the US government was under criticism from American universities and from all across the world um, because it planned to cancel the visas of Chinese graduate students and researchers in the United States who had ties to certain universities which were believed by the government to be affiliated with the People's Liberation Army. This policy threatened to affect thousands of Chinese graduate students and researchers who played important roles in knowledge production in the US higher education and in enhancing international research collaboration and mutual understanding. And this is not beneficial to either either side, either Chinese higher education or the American higher education. Well, in Tianxia, if we think from this perspective, there's no other and belongingness is not based on locality, race or culture. Regulations limiting international mobility of academics and students and an international research collaboration might not have an intrinsic justification and need to be reconsidered based on the new relationship between the world and the countries from a Tianxia perspective. To wrap up, I want to say that we humanity live in and share a global common world. The sustainable development of the world requires sufficient provision of collective goods. Under provision of these global collective goods can result in problems. A vivid and very recent example is demonstrated by the way we cope with the COVID-19 pandemic with which the, the cost of which is human lives. Despite the limitations of the Tianxia idea in real politics, certain aspects of the idea, especially those in relation to Tianxia as a normative appeal, values, mutual respect, diversity, um, understanding, etc., may provide an alternative way to solving the challenges we face in higher education. Well, that's my presentation. Back to you, Simon, or Ling wants to share some of your thoughts now. Thank you. Okay. There's a hundred questions and things I'd, I'd like to say in response, but I think the first op the first opportunity to speak on what you've said is going to be Lynn's. Can I come in now, Lynn? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, Okay, uh, many thanks, Simon and Lily. Uh, I think this is a very interesting presentation and it is also a cross-disciplinary presentation as it relates not only higher education, but also political science and the sociology. As Lily's research partner and her friend, I would like to give some comments. So first, I think Lily might be the first person to discuss the idea of Tianxia with relation to public common and collective goods in the area of higher education. Actually, based on the interviews in my previous research, the idea of Tianxia is quite close to a community with shared future for 
humanity. We call it as Ren-Lei-Ming-Yin-Gong-Tong-Ti in Chinese. And this idea also implies that all humans live in the same planet and they shoulder the same responsibility to make their lives better. In other words, it emphasizes that individuals in the global society belong to the same community of interest. Underlying the growing interdependence and convergence between countries and the regions. So everyone has unshakable responsibility for making a better world. That is to say, Lily's funding are also partly supported by my research. However, I am also concerned about the ideas of Tianxia and a community with a shared future for humanity due to the risk of center periphery, just as Lily mentioned. As many people consider these two ideas are Chinese discourses. So how we really practice, it, practice these two ideas on a more inclusive and equitable basis and to what extent the international community will accept them still need further discussion. Second, to some degree in the area of higher education, the idea of Tianxia and the collective goods are somewhat related to the idea of egalitarianism in the higher education systems of most continental European countries. However, in the Chinese context, not similar to the egalitarianism is that higher education in China often emphasizes selection and competition in student admission based on examinations, for example, Gaokao, um, the university entrance examination, with the aim of achieving merit-based admission. And one of Simon's chapter in the year of 2013 has made a detailed explanation for this from a cultural perspective. Third, I found it is very interesting that Lily cited Zhao Tingyang's statement that to think through the world rather than to think of the world. I think most of us just thinking of the world. So the first step to think through the world might be building the sense of global citizenship. And this is also a necessity for everyone in this increasingly globalized world. Um, okay, then I also have one question. Um, Lily mentioned that there is a need to better balance the relationship between knowledge available for humanity and protecting intellectual property rights. So my question is how to balance it? Any thought, thoughts on it? Mm, okay, that's all for my comments and the questions. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Lynn. Lily, I think if you answer Lynn's question, that can begin the discussion. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Um, to, to answer your questions, I think um, it's important to think in two ways. The first is the accessibility of knowledge. So open access data is one um, and open access publications can be one move forward. Uh, but in addition to that, we might also need to think about how to make the, really the public can accept and understand the knowledge, not only just giving them this publication, they might not actually have the interest or understand those contents, but to make them more available to the public is another thing to think about. And there also, Mm, there are also other aspects, for example, the competition, uh, how universities are involved in competition, um, business competition, and how those research findings are um, getting involved in uh, competitions between incorporations and especially those um, medicine companies. So these are ideas of how universities might think about itself rather uh, not in so deeply involved in a market mechanism, and perhaps the funding from the public purse can be helpful in this area as well. Thank you, Lily. Lily, um, I want to congratulate you on this really excellent presentation of your work. I mean, I think that's the clearest statement I've seen on these issues anywhere. And um, it really raises a lot of questions for us. Uh, I mean, there's no more important issue in the world, you know, than how the international interstate worldwide system works, how it relates to itself. Um, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because, you know, the noise of public matters and policy issues and so on is such that you often forget that some of the most important issues are not discussed 
and the and 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 achieving coordinated international order is absolutely fundamental to everything else that we face you know all the great the great challenge i mean clearly the pandemic's only a dress rehearsal for the environmental catastrophe to come uh, and it's within our all of our lifetimes that that will come and we're moving no further forward on this question that you've raised about the nature of the global order um, what you might call world society in some other um, terminology uh, and and the western solution the westphalian solution is the notion of sovereign nation states that command their own territory have a zero-sum relationship with each other and ag agree on a civil way to relate to each other so that when they declare war they do it by announcing it in advance and so on um, and uh, it's uh, it doesn't provide a, a way of resolving the common issues um, there is something in the argument that you make that the Chinese tradition is different. I mean, if you look at since the Tang dynasty anyway, after the Tang, um, there's only been two periods where China was an aggressive military power and they were both foreign dynasties, um, the Yuan and, and, and the Qing, where in both cases, China pushed its empire out. But in the, in the Chinese national traditions, in the dynasties that were Chinese national, there wasn't the same external aggression it was a different relationship with uh, with the rest of the world. And that's been true of the modern period, you know, post-1949 as well. There hasn't been uh, an aggressive process of conquest you know, in that history. There hasn't been sending large numbers of troops to the Middle East or Afghanistan or Central America or something to try and solve the political problems of those countries. Uh, China doesn't do those things. So there is something in this, in this point that Tianxia idea, you know, permeates in some respects the way that China relates to the world. What I want to raise is these two problem areas, it seems to me, when you try and roll out Chanxia as an idea for the world as a whole. The first one is the problem of the democratic tradition, of course. Now here, I'm not talking about the top, you know, whether you can contest the top of government. I mean, it seems to me that there's nothing particularly um, virtuous about a political system that means that if you spend a billion do do dollars on Facebook advertising, you can change the president or the governor of the state. There's nothing very attractive about that. What I mean is the, the grassroots, the from below tradition. Now, the way in which the, the um, Chinese polity managed it was there was a top-down imperial tradition, relatively benevolent most of the time, um, and, and, and the village ran itself. You know, at, at, it, the, the writ of the state stopped at the level of the top of the village so that the villages were generally self-managing. Uh, it's changed in the modern era and there are issues there, although the individual is also in some respects stronger than before as well. So there's some positive things that have happened too. Um, but the Western tradition and it's, in its grassroots way is an attractive one. And I'd include the Americans here. The Americans are very good at grassroots democracy and the so are West Europeans in many places. Um, very robust civic traditions, self-management, and the European Union has a principle that you push decisions down as low as possible to the point where they're most affecting people rather than try and make them top down. So I'm not sure how a Tenshia idea with its elite decision making and so on is going to mesh with a self-determining, self-forming population. So I think that's quite an important problem. The second one, of course, is the one that you've alluded to and Lynn has brought forward, and that's the problem of what you might call Sinic hegemony. I mean, if you look, you know, there is, as you know, there's lots of interpretations of Qianxia in Chinese history, and the bulk of them seem to be Sinocentric, um, you know, to see the world in terms of China and, and, the, and others, or China and beyond. I mean, you can rethink Qianxia outside that framework, I know. So I think the question is, is how to do that. How to factor in diversity, which you've emphasised in your presentation. I mean, there seems to me there's several ways you could do this, but um, you could talk about uh, a decentered Tianxia, which has no essential, you know, moral center, um, which is not the idea as it was originally conceived. Or you could talk about a negotiated center where not just the Sinic tradition, but the other traditions in the world, South Asia, Latin America, Africa, North America, Europe, and so on, Russia come into play, you know, and, and have a say on what the core values should be, a kind of negotiated center. Um, or you could talk about it, um, as being, um, I suppose, more decentralized. Uh, but the alternative is to have a Sinic center. And until there's a solution to this question of Sinic hegemony, then Tianxia is not going to be attractive to the rest of the world. So it's quite fundamental. 
So it has to be recast. So those two points, it seems to me, grassroots democracy tradition, how does that fit? And the second point, the really big sticking point about global diversity. Thank you very much, Sam. Really good comments. And um, turning to your first point, I think it's important, as, as you mentioned, that there, in Chinese long history, there was uh, this tradition of grassroots um, bottom-up pr pr procedure for local governance rather than um, always top down and the central government's reach was quite limited not they did they did not have the reach to the local level or village level but then the situation changed in the modern period of time and um, because of the political uh, reforms and the new um, new new ways of how government um, operates it's different now and I know that even though I know that, the, for example, the philosopher Zhao Tianyang, he was also um, quite challenged by the idea of meritocracy and how that may be um, combined with the democracy idea. So he was saying that he was raising the, this idea of smart democracy or smart governance that takes into consider all kinds of all, part, all parties into, into this uh, decision making procedure, not only elites, but he was Give, he was saying that given, given the knowledge, um, the importance of knowledge in decision making to make the decision more scientific, it's perhaps it's, more, it's necessary to give more weight to um, elite's decisions rather than give everyone equal say. But that, is, that can involve and invite new critics and um, challenges, but that is something um, a specific scholar was trying to solve um, why to combine this um, elite idea and also grassroots bottom-up um, procedure in the decision making. But that is definitely one um, dilemma for the Tianxia idea, uh, especially in today's world with the nation state, with the central government, with such a strong power and a strong reach to local levels. If the government was like uh, imperial times, then there wouldn't be such problem, but then um, it's a different time now. Well, second to your question of the Chinese hegemon, I think that is important because um, if we stick to the original idea of Tianxia, then there is inevitably the idea of central periphery or the tributary system related to the Tianxia idea. But perhaps this is time for scholars to rethink or further and de further de develop the idea of Tianxia and to make it um, more adjustable, uh, to make it more um, better workable to the current situation. And perhaps, as you mentioned, one of the possible way I think is to combine the idea with the pro pluralism, the idea of different parties getting into together to define what Tianxia is rather than giving a well, this is Chinese understanding of Tianxia and everybody needs to accept that. So I'm more, I'm kind of more keen towards your idea of um, negotiated Tianxia that just to, this is an initiative appeal for different parties to think that, to rethink the current world order that is not, no long, it's not only about the national uh, methodological nationalism, how it's under, the world is understood, but it can be imagined in a different way. And it calls for different countries, different cultures to work together to think that perhaps values, mutual respect, diversity, harmony can be important values in this process. Well, well said. And, and you know, you've accumulated 12 or 14 people on the call list. And this is the Vicky Bolivar type performance. This is really superb, but I have to congratulate you for that. I'm going to bring in people who haven't made a you know a, a regular contribution to webinars and some new names and then we'll get back to some of our really great regular commentators. Um, let me bring in uh, Su Ming Ku at this point. Uh, thanks, Simon. Thank you, Lily, for a really great uh, paper, um, and that's really opened up such a broad conversation. And thank you, Simon, for putting it in maybe the broader context or problem of. Um, you know, the problem of global coordination. So my question that I did put into the chat was really how do we relate this uh, Tianxia Weigong concept to concepts about common goods? 
because I really think the way in which we think about common goods is really has been very impoverished. So I started doing a very small piece of work a number of years ago for Commonwealth Health and Government and uh, Educational Partnerships when those briefings were still uh, uh, being provided for the uh, education and health ministers meetings. And uh, they stopped doing it about two or three years ago now, but they used to do them every year as kind of briefings for the summits. And what I wanted to bring into the picture was this uh, conversation that had been taking place in a small part of the UN about rethinking global goods and uh, rethinking this uh, a problem of the, because we see with the global pandemic, we have uh, uh, experienced um, the problems of the under provision of global public goods. So there has been a lot of work that has been done, but it's really in this very small part of the UN that nobody pays much attention to. And so I, I was really going to invite you to think about the common goods part of the Tianxia concept in relation to um, some other work that's been done on public goods and global public goods specifically. So I wondered if you had taken into consideration this and uh, to engage you in a bit of conversation about that. Thank you very much. That's very important comments and question. Um, actually, both global public goods and global common goods are considered. And in my um, work, in my understanding, I understand it is global collective goods or collective goods of Tianxia. I define it as a combination of global collective goods, global public goods and global common goods. So on the one hand for global public goods, it's useful as it points to the market failure and uh, financing problems, for example, in higher education, mm -hmm. and as well as the distributional issues, including justice. Mm -hmm. But it's limited that it's understand um, goods in only economic terms. So that's where global common goods come in, comes in and add in agency, diversity, bottom-up procedure um, in this um, process, and normative collectivity as well, um, and non-state non actors, which is helpful. Um, and both of these are important to the understanding of goods, but they share the common limitation, I think, um, not necessarily with the common goods itself, but the global, how the global is understood uh, from a nation state perspective and the today's um, uh, nation state world. So as you, as you already mentioned that, even though we, we think from this global common good perspective, we still face the problem of under provision of global common goods and it's not easy for countries to coordinate with each other at the global level and for international organizations to sustain the production of global common goods and that i think is primarily derived because of the um idea of this nation, nation states the strong nation states that is too powerful and make makes make making uh, international organizations less powerful and rather vulnerable in this process, including uh, other non-governmental agencies, institutions. So what, what I want to say here is not, um, I didn't want to get too much involved in the differences between public goods, common goods, or collective goods, because that would invite, that would be another whole di different story to tell. But then uh, I want to say that this is the main problem would be the global, how we understand global, the world order. Thanks very much. Let me share with you, um, I'll try and find the file, a very short briefing on um, uh, what I call a new public goods approach. Let me see if I can find the file. Thank you. Thank you. You're muted, Simon. Thanks, David. Um, Hong Wai. You're next. Hi. Hi, Lily. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, I'm just wondering a bit, the bit about, uh, where you mentioned about the Chinese military. I think uh, for all of us in this chat, we may be more interested in if you can expand on a bit more about the Chinese military part of your presentation. Also, um, it seems to me that Tianxia is quite a static concept. How can you bring change and innovation into this? 
um, especially at this time of COVID, innovation is very important in global development. Thank you, Simon. Tony, your first question, I, I, I'm afraid I might disappoint you a bit because, sorry, oh, okay, I need to speak up. So, You're muted. Oh, okay. Can you turn your volume up? Thank please. you for your question. Um, and concerning your first question, I'm afraid that I might disappoint you a bit because um, my whole intention and the whole analysis of my work was not there is no intention to get too much into the real politics side of the discussion and to get into the type of political and military discussion. And what I wanted to do is to, from a normative, to emphasize values and mutual diversity, etc., that how we can rethink high education practice. But as you mentioned, and this also Simon also talked about that, until this globe, this Chinese hegemon idea is really solved this central idea that might not be that attractive to the global audiences. Well, I want to focus more on your second question, the static ness of the central idea. I agree with you that because of the insistence and con consistency of the Chinese history, there isn't too much change or uh, transformation of ideas, but there are developments of ideas. And we can see that even for Confucianism, uh, Neo Confucianism and the Song Dynasty, Ming Dynasty, and New Confucianism today have moved away, partly at least, from classical Confucianism. So it demonstrates how scholars and thinkers are working on renewing those classical ideas that were developed 2000, more than 2000 years ago to make it more, um, better adjust the current situation. And now I think. It's, I, I, as I previously talked about that, I think it's important to invite diversified cultures, diversified voices, plural voices into this discussion, not to impose, well, this is Chinese idea, and then we need to employ that, that's not the case. The case is that we are offering a different way of understanding this world order, and as a bottom-up process, the different voices can work together to, for better coordination and um, to work on the same common challenges and issues that is for the good of humanity. Thank, thanks, Lily. Um, thanks, Hongwei. We're running out of time and we've got a lot of people. So can I ask all questioners and answers to, be, to now be brief if possible? Jay Derrick is next. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Simon. And thank you so much, Lily, for such an interesting talk. Um, particularly for me, I don't know enough about this, uh, this, this uh, well, particularly the Chinese perspective on these issues, which is terrific. Um, what I want to ask is then, you might even be a predictor, and Simon, in a way, has restated the question. Um, you mentioned meritocracy, and I know, I'm aware that meritocracy is an important part of Chinese traditions, the idea of merit. Um, another set of questioners has mentioned the problem of the changing world. Everything changes all the time. So how will criteria of merit continually be remade in a way that can be agreed? How would the, I'm interested in the practicalities really, how can we get agreement about what counts as merit? Thank you very much. And first, I, I think this is this is just the intention of this presentation to um, introduce this Chinese idea perspective to the global audiences. And I'm happy that you now um, have done more um, have more information about this idea. So concerning your, I, your question about the marriage, I think that's a really important one. And there has been a lot of changes in how we understand marriage in, in the Chinese practice in higher education. And there is still a lot of problems, I think, there. So for example, previously in, in period times, um, the, because of the pragmatist tradition of China that knowledge is used to, for governance, to, to contribute to the governance and how uh, literati at that time to participate in this governance process and make uh, 
the country, a better country. That was a main criteria of merit. Then because of the change of, of the country and now it's more oriented toward oriented towards technology, science, and the real use of, of knowledge. Then because of this change of what is really pragmatic, what is useful, then the, the way how we recruit students and how we examine students also change accordingly. And now in China, for example, there is a strong emphasis on examination scores. For example, if you uh, want to get into a good university, then you should perform well in a Chinese university entrance examination. And the scores is a major part in that process. But that is problematic, as many have pointed out. It's problematic. It might um, overlook a lot of other capacity um, of students. Well, but I have some personal views here that is kind of consistent with uh, a much sense idea of capability and also relevant to the Chinese Confucian idea of moral autonomy that how we, we say what kind of students we want to educate, we want our students to become, and that might reflect or might have to shed light on what we think about marriage. I'm not sure if I answer your question. Lily, um, we're very short of time. So what I'm going to do is take several questions now um, and, uh, and we'll take them all to get, uh, you know, together and then you can answer them all together and then, then we'll have to finish up. Um, so we'll see how many we can get through. Um, the, our next, uh, so folks, those of you are on the call list and there are many, be ready to be asked to ask your question. I won't have time to get to you all um, perhaps, but uh, I might call you in, so be warned. Um, the uh, next uh, question or first question in the sequence is from Qingling, Qingling Kong. Yeah, here. Thanks, Lily, for the interpretation of Tianxia in the higher education arena. Actually, from the limitations you just talked about, what I sensed is a tension between Tianxia, all under heaven with no boundaries, versus the nation state that has a boundary. So in this sense, would you think the supranational actors such as international organizations are better placed to address the uh, provision of uh, public goods? For example, the academic, academic mobility, research on global higher education issues and global citizenship. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Um... Jingling. Uh, next question is from Yanru Xu. Yanru. You'll have to unmute Yan Yanru. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's not a question, but I would like to share some some my thoughts because I see the chat box that uh, some colleagues read some uh, some concerns about the concept of uh, Tianxia and the relationship between Tianxia and the higher education. So uh, we talk about uh, we talk a lot about Confucius, Con Confucius, but I would like to uh, like have dialogue between Confucius and the Mu'ad uh, because I'm quite uh, I I quite like uh, Mu'ad. What has what more they have said that Jian Ai Fei Gong Xing Shang Xian Shang Tong Xing Tian Xia Zhili that is that universal love and respect the talent so that could facilitate the like the benefit the common good so what what would what could we do to promote higher education through the concept of Tian Xia I think we could think through the the knowledge you know. It's it is a universal knowledge. It, knowledge could have could 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 have no border. It's not like political border, but we could have a borderless knowledge in global higher education. So that's just my some 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 of my thoughts. It's not a question. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. You. Uh, and our next uh, question from Elil Cohen. Hello. Thanks very much for this. Um, just very briefly, uh, it's kind of a similar theme, but I'm wondering if. There is a way really for Chancha to, as a concept, to be conceptualized such that it doesn't lead to competing notions of center. And the kind of historical context of this is 
just because I, I know a little bit about Korean history from I lived there for a few years and was interested in it. So I know that back in kind of like, I guess we're talking fourth or fifth century, they saw themselves as the kind of the weaker power when, you know, China has an empire, Japan has an empire, and Korea basically defined themselves as an empire by basically claiming to be an, a, a center east of the sea kind of thing. So, so they were using this, they kind of using their own con that concept back against them, if you like. So I'm wondering, is that is that is that not inevitable? Is it inevitable? Um, so yeah, thank you. That's my question. I'm next going to bring in uh, Jiyuan Bian. Jiyuan, are you there? Hi, is it me? Um, so my question is that how does the the idea of Tiansha fit into the existing? concepts of, um, for example, co uh, global citizenships or egalitarian, or uh, was this idea only limit to, limited to uh, Chinese culture? Um, and uh, how, how would it play out in practice? Thank you. That was Yi Wen. Um, I was actually looking for Zhi Yuan Bian. Um, hi, yes, I'm here. Could you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, yes, based on President Xi Jinping's double first class university project policy texts and his very recent speeches, we can find that actually um, within the political discourses, uh, nationalism and patriotism, they are very crucial political discourses. Uh, what is uh, nationalism and patriotism? Uh, let me just introduce a little bit. The, Chinese Communist Party deployed patriotism based on state-led nationalism to identify the party state with the broader Chinese nation, and thus to define patriotism with regard to loyalties to the uh, Communist Party and support for its continuing rule. And we can see the policy, uh, this double first class policy discourse uh, they define what is high level talent with Chinese features um, and uh, traditional Confucian ideas seem to be reshaped um, in, for example, core socialist val uh, values proposed by President Xi Jinping to regulate how citizens uh, including higher education students see themselves. So I'm wondering how the idea of Tianxia could help us understand the current political discourse of higher education and uh, particularly China's role in contributing to the public good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Xi Yuan. And uh, that of course is the core practical challenge, the nation states and the uh, and, and Tianxia. Um, now, I think we've just got time if you're quick to bring in, we'll bring in Sayong Lee and finish with David Mills and then give Lily her vast right of reply after all those questions. Sayong. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Lily, for your insightful talk. And my question is very simple. What would be the implications of the Tiangsha idea on the more individual level, like teaching and learning in, high in global higher education? Thank you. Over to you, David. David. David Mills. David must have dropped out. Um, Lily, I think you've now got the unenviable task of um, fitting all of those questions into your all under heaven. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. And but that's what Chinchia is all about, being able to embrace this diversity. So good luck. Yes. And I'm just trying to contribute my perspective to this an open dialogue. So first, for the first question, I think the UN supernatural, supranational organization's role, I think it's important. And that is uh, how we try to sustain the production of global collective goals in contemporary times. But as I, also, as I am aware that there is a problem, it's rather weak compared to nation states. So unless we might we can reimagine the relationship between states, we re reimagine the world order, the supranational institutions might not actually um, play a, as much uh, play a, as much effective role as they can they can do. The second one is uh, 
I think I agree with Yan Ru about the bodiless knowledge, and that is not a question. The third one is um, conceptualization of Tianxia with, in terms of no competition. I think that existed in, in Imperial China, that China, Chinese state was, when there was a unification of the country, it was not actually interested in competing with other countries. So, for example, we have the um, what we call East Columbia. Uh, he voyaged to the Southeast Asia for a long time ago, but then the dynasty, the government was not interested in expansion or competition. It was just a, a way to show off its power, even though that was a problem as well, but there was no competition existed. And the fourth one, global citizenship, um, I think, and there were two questions in relation to global citizenship. I think even Chinese people might need to also think more about Tianxia idea. It's not saying that because this is a Chinese idea that we need to think Tianxia from the perspective of Tianxia to think of world as a world per se, not as an aggregation of nation states, does not mean that everyone in China is doing well in terms of thinking global citizenship or pr practice implementing global citizenship education. In higher education, in China, there is also a tendency of nationalism and um, patriotism as, uh, as Jiu already mentioned. That is something we also need to think about and tackle in future. And, all, and the last question I think is um, implications for individual level. I think there are a lot. Uh, one, the, the on top of my head is the way our individual to rethink what we can do as a world citizen as a global citizen and then to rethink and when there are more and more people doing in that way then there might be a solution comes uh, comes up we can come up with a solution from this collective contribution from people um I'd like to thank you again, Lily, and thank you, Lynn. I would have liked to have been able to bring you back in, um, but we've run out of time, unfortunately. But I hope we, you'll you'll be back on the webinar series to talk about your own research. Um, the uh, I want to apologise to the five or six people that I couldn't get to on the call list. Um, it's interesting the nature of the dialogue and the nature of the questions raised. Uh, I think one of the problems you have when you're a, someone from outside the dominant country coming in and speaking about your country to some extent is that you're seen as a representative of everything in it. So you're sort of held to account for everything that China does and is, uh, when in fact, of course, there is one voice of, of, of millions and, uh, and one with a, one perspective amongst many others. And this is Lee's just doing what a critical scholar does in any national context, advancing your own view and putting that forward is a good idea. Um, and commend you for that, Lily, and uh, won't hold you accountable for everything in Chinese domestic or foreign policy for the last 30 years. Um, the, uh, uh, the principles that you've, you've laid out, I think, are very thought provoking, and there's a normative you know, strand to your argument, which is, goes beyond the usual scholarly discourse, I think, that we have on webinars, where we actually, you explicitly raise certain ideas as virtue and, 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 and possibly unifying ideas. I would like to say, I think that in response to that, that we in the CG webinar series do practice some of your thoughts already. One is that we seek to dismantle national barriers and have a common conversation about common good, about common interest. And we try to do that in every webinar. We, we really don't see the national framing as useful or helpful most of the time. Anyway, it's better to set it aside. The second way in which we practice what you've been talking about is, that, is the idea of unity and diversity. You know, the, the webinar series is a conversation where we try to bring in different perspectives and learn from different perspectives. And I think you and Lynn have helped us to do that today. So thank you very much as usual. Great interest in your work. And uh, we look forward to your next contribution to the series. Now, our next webinar folks is on uh, next Tuesday. And I'm just fine looking for the information about it. It's Jan MacArthur from Lancaster, and she's going to talk about assessment um, as she does. And she, her, her focus on assessment is assessment for social justice. And she'll bring forward ways in which the assessment paradigm can be constructed around social justice objectives. So a curriculum and social equity discussion next Tuesday. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you all for coming. Bye for now.